So my guest today is I can't quite get to the next load. Ed Everts. And Ed works with leaders to build their self-awareness so they can self-manage more effectively and with teams to ensure that they're productive and effective. He's the author of Drive Your Career, Nine High Impact Ways to Take Responsibility for Your Own Success, coming out on September 22nd, 2020. He also hosts twice-weekly podcast, Be Brave at Work, which is a title that I absolutely love. Ed, thanks for making time to, to show up today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here, and I look forward to sharing some, I hope, good tidbits with your audience. I'm sure they will be. <laughs> if they aren't, I'm going to be annoyed, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> I do not want to annoy you, so I will. Thank you. You, you know better. So people, most of the time, we spend time talking about the job search. And here we're going to be talking about launching in the new role. It's the stuff the search is over. Hallelujah. Everyone's happy. The wife, husband, partner, kids are all thrilled. The dog is going to eat well. And now it's time to start in the new job and be a hero right out of the box because you've got the halo around you. And people kind of walk in haphazardly, don't they? So They do, you know, and that's, you know, part of what you're describing is what happens that people think their effort ends once they land the job. And so now they are working and they can put all that effort aside and not focus on anything other than the job itself. And the work that I do with clients helps them think about it a little bit differently. So what sort of things should people be doing differently that they don't? Maybe, you know, if, if you can give us the basics of what the typical person does, and then we can start looking at the things that they do differently. Well, the typical person comes into a new role and instantly starts looking for kind of low-hanging fruit, things that they can implement or change or do differently so that they are impacting the organization. And by doing so, they're kind of skipping over a variety of activities that they should do in order to really solidify themselves at that organization. And so they start working on projects, they start working on initiatives and goals and things of that nature, and they are missing some activities, which I'll share with you that they should do in order to make a progress. And then next thing you know, they're so caught up with projects and initiatives and goals, they don't have time to go back and do this pre-work as they start their new opportunity. And, and when you talk about this, it, it kind of reminds me about how important it is to connect with the people there. Because I didn't hear you say anything about the people, let alone the peers, the peers of your boss, uh, who you might be interacting with, things along the, people along those lines who are going to be evaluating, assessing you and things along those lines. Uh, so I'm curious the kinds of things that you think people should be doing when they, when they start up. Well, the people equation is super critical. And one thing that new leaders can do if you are leading a group of people or leading a team is to ensure that during your first 90 days, and I am a big fan of this kind of 90 day window where you don't make any big decisions. You, of course, you make decisions on things that are put on your table that you need to decide, but you don't look for things to change and implement differently. But during that first 90 days is to meet with folks and ask them what I call the million dollar question, which is, you know, what's one or two things I could be doing in order to do this job effectively? Because these folks have history with the person that was there before, they have history with the company. They know what they like. They know what they don't like. And it's so important for you to know what had happened so you don't repeat it. You know, people don't want a repeater, somebody to come in and just be like the last person that was there. And the only way you can do that is during the first 90 days is to ensure that you talk with people about what you could do differently or what you could do to uh, have a very impactful impact at the organization. One of the things I tell people to do is, and this is, you know, this can take place on an interview with your future boss, but certainly with the people that you meet with once you're on board. Uh, my predecessor, what did they do well? What, is, what did they do that made you happy? Uh, what might you have liked that they could have done differently? Because I obviously want to continue the things that you liked and change the things that you didn't. And that, that kind of sounds like that kind of a question. It is, and you would be surprised how many people don't do that, right? Again, they get so caught up in goals and objectives and in impressing their boss that they don't spend enough time understanding critical data points as to how the last person performed 
the job that they had done. I'm working with a client now, for example, who is going to take over leadership of a nonprofit. The prior president founded the nonprofit 40 years ago. So this person has been in charge of this entity for 40 years, and he is now the second CEO of the organization. And I was talking about just the huge difference and impact that's going to have to have a new leader in the organization. And the first thing you need to do is ensure people know, and this is really the second tip, Jeff, is to ensure that you set expectations for people that, you know, on day two, you're not going to come in and change the world, that you want to understand how things work. You want to understand how people work together. Some people work really well together. Some people don't. You want to observe this. And then after 90 days, you can come in and say, hey, here's what I've observed. Here's what I think I see happening. And here's one or two things I think we could do differently to be more effective. You're going to have so much more credibility after 90 days because you've now experienced it a little than a new leader, a new leader who comes, who comes in and after two or three days starts saying, hey, here's what I think could do differently. The first thought in people's head is, what do you know? You know, you've just got here a week ago. <laughs> you can't know everything that we're doing and how it's going. And so we make that error in timing by making change too quickly. It's funny that you use that example, you know, for the person who's been there for 40 years and the successor steps in, I would think that the first thing that should happen is to figure out what was going on well during their time. I assume it was a retirement. They weren't pushed out because mm -hmm. I hear 40 yep. years. They didn't start at age 20. Uh, so I'm working with the assumption that they started at a fairly early stage of this organization. But still, it was retirement time. They weren't pushed out. Well, you know, and there's two types of ways that you uh, engage in a new role at an organization. One is you're hired into the company. So you've never worked there before. And day one is day one at the company. Or in the case of the second CEO after the 40 year person is he's worked there. So he has observed the leader in action. He's observed the pluses. And one of the reasons I'm working with him as a coach is because he's observing the minuses and he doesn't want to repeat those minuses. But the third piece of advice I would give Jeff is, especially for somebody who's taking over a senior leadership role in an organization, is to start and create a transition committee. And so a transition committee, especially for this new CEO, who is the second person in 40 years, he needs to create some bandwidth around himself and the impact his leadership is going to have in the organization. And the best way to do that is to create a transition team of people who are going to help you. You can't do it alone. And you need people to help you spread the word. You need people to help set expectations. You need to help uh, manage the workload that's coming at you. And you can only do that effectively if you have, you know, what I call a transition team. And you know, so many people walk in with hero complexes. You know, I'm oh, going definitely. to ride in on the white horse and save the day. I'm the new messiah of the organization. I'm going to lead you into salvation. And a person who's elevated may not have that sort of thing, but they have a variation of it that basically translates into, I'm in charge. Definitely, and I think they all have a variation of that. And I think you're right that there are people who are like, hey, I'm here, I was hired for a reason to save this company, and I'm gonna start on day two. And you know, quite frankly, unless it's low-hanging fruit of something that needs to be fixed, like a client complaint that needs to get addressed, Day two is the wrong day to start making those types of changes. And so you need help from others to help you navigate and ensure that the perception people have of you isn't that you're the superhero who's going to save the world, but someone who's come in to lead them to do their jobs more effectively. And I kind of think in uh, comparison from sports where... Um, you know, two coaches of the New York Giants, the original one, Bill Parcells, that I'm thinking of, and then later on, Tom Coughlin, basically had leadership teams of players around them because both of them were a little, shall we say, rough around the edges as personalities. Uh, a polite way of saying they were gruff as all hell, folks. And Coughlin, in particular, annoyed his team. And it was little things like, you're late if you're not there 10 minutes early. Right. Right. And eventually the leadership team uh, was brought in by the ownership, said, we've got to soften this up a little bit because the players are rebelling, which is absolutely true. And mm -hmm. the idea of this having senior, senior players within the organization, not coaches, not people uh, with titles, but senior players who had positive reputations with 
their teammates in effect be the buffer between the coach and the rest of the team. And it kind of sounds like that's what you're talking about here. Well, I guarantee you that those New York Giants uh, coaches did not have transition teams <laughs> to help them uh, figure out the best way to start leading. And, you know, it sounds so subtle, but something like, you know, if you're not at the meeting 10 minutes early, you're late is a behavior that is an expectation by that person, right? So unless I know that, I'm going to find out probably in a negative way, which is I'm going to show up two minutes early thinking I'm early and I'm going to get in trouble because I wasn't there 10 minutes early, right? So, you know, those are all the things that new leadership brings organizations. They're very subtle, but over time, if they're not addressed, they explode, right? And finally, that coach says, you know, gosh darn it, I'm sick of this poor behavior. I want to see this, this, this. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, where did all this come from? Right. So backing up for a little bit to the first meeting with all the others, and we're going to first talk about this from a leadership perspective, but let's also look at it from the staff perspective as well. A staff person joining an organization. What sort of things might be asked of the people that you're meeting with um, from the standpoint of the leader of an organization, like the one that you met? Who are they meeting with? Is it the board? Who's the conversations with? And for the staff person, who are they going to be getting together with? Well, the first question for a staff member, let's start with that person, sure. is who, whom do I need to meet with? So you need to speak with your boss and say, again, to set an expectation that during the first 90 days, I want to assess what's happening and how it's happening, because I believe I can impact the uh, organization more effectively if I do that. It may be 60 days. I'm not saying it's literally 90 days, but you need a window of time that you set an expectation for so you have the ability to observe and influence what's happening at the organization. So you need to get a list of names, especially if you're from outside the organization, of whom you need to speak to. And then you need to speak with those people. You need to go through a very structured uh, experience with them where you send them an invite, you ensure they understand why you want to meet with them, you want that they understand the goals of meeting with them, and that you spend time talking with them about what they've experienced in the organization. I loved your example from earlier, you know, what did the prior person do well? What could the prior person have done differently? What do you think we could do differently to be more effective? You know, if you were king of the world, you know, what's one thing you would do here that others haven't done? This is a huge behavior on the part of a new staff member to understand exactly, quote unquote, what they've gotten themselves into. Because oftentimes in recruitment, we're in heaven and there's no problems and everything's perfect here. And then on day one, hell kicks in and it's suddenly, oh, and by the way, you have to terminate Ed tomorrow like, well, wait a minute, I just started. But these things happen, right? So uh, you need to ensure, you know, who you talk to falling under that behavior, Jeff, of uh, talking with people to understand what it is that worked well and people are looking for you to do in order to be more effective. Not dissimilar to a leader who also needs to understand who reports to him or her in the organization and speak with those people about what could be done differently et cetera, in order to have a positive influence on the organization. So let me speak to the staff person, for example, and simply say, you know, you were lied to during the interviews. And I say that very simply because I've never heard of an employer ever say to a job hunter, you know, I've got a problem here. Mm -hmm. You know, my predecessor got fired and so did hers. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out my butt's on the line. And I, I need to hire someone to help me save it. Instead, everyone puts on these happy smile button faces. We've got a great opportunity with a terrific team of people. Did I mention we're kind of like family around here? Like the family in the holiday movies that are at one another's throats, yeah. <laughs> and you, on the other hand, of course, were trying to persuade them and you were on good behavior too. So we got to kind of, recalibrate for what the reality is. Obviously, there's some good stuff there, but we just want to make sure that what it is we're stepping into. And yeah, I think, I just interrupt real quickly, I think most people probably have a positive experience that what they were shared is accurate, but if in fact life's a bell curve, there are going to be the people you're describing who find on day one what they anticipated is different. And I've shared with you stories about people whose job title has changed on day one, where they say, hey, welcome to the organization. Oh, by the way, we've decided to make some changes and you're no longer the director of this, you're now the director of that. And you're like, what? You know, how did that happen? I've had people who have left organizations within 30 to 60 days because the environment and culture was so negative and so opposite what they were described in the interview. 
ethically, they couldn't work there. They're like, this just isn't what I thought I was getting hired into. And before I get into deep and find it harder to leave, I'm going to get out sooner. So true. And thus, at that first meeting, and you're asking about what my predecessor did well, what they could they have done better, where could someone dig in deeper to find out more? What sort of things could they ask to go in an extra layer? Well, you, what you're doing is in asking these questions, there is a little bit of magic to the madness, is you're looking for patterns, right? You're looking for patterns and trends of activities or behaviors or relationships. Uh, you know, if everyone says Bob and Sue don't get along, then that's probably something that you're going to have to pay attention to. If one person said Bob and Sue didn't get along and, and everyone else thinks it's terrific, it may not be a priority for you, right? But, you know, your goal is to really look for trends of activities or behaviors that you think may be having either a positive or negative influence on the organization. So it's not just asking the question and taking good notes and then going home, but it's listening really well. It's asking questions, follow-up questions, and general questions like, tell me a little bit more about that. What do you mean by that, right? Without getting too specific, you know, someone will say, oh, you know, your predecessor could have gotten back to people better. Well, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, and, and you know, after you ask it three or four times, you, you get to the point, right? You get to the key activity that that leader wasn't doing that you can now do differently, right? Or at least be aware of that people are sensitive to it because people are different uh, sensitive to different things in different cultures. And you want to be aware of that to know, again, what you've gotten yourself into. And I'm wondering if one of the questions they might ask, and, and this is me being with my therapist you know, hat on, because I have that <laughs> training as well. Um, but you have to take the coach hat off and put well, the therapist right. hat on. <laughs> and it becomes, why do you think that was? After all, yeah. you know, you, I'm sure you asked for them to stay in touch with you and they didn't. Why do you think that was? Right. These are very general questions and people worry because they don't, they say, well, Ed, I don't know what questions to ask. I'm like, you don't need to ask a specific question. You don't need to be a subject matter expert on the topic. Ask, can you tell me a little bit more? What did you mean by that? Why do you think they did that? Right. These are very general, non-specific questions. But what it does is it causes the person being asked the question to dig deeper. You know, there's that exercise. I forget what it's called, the three question or six question where you say why because the first thing the person said isn't the real reason, but it's a very general reason. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, why is that? And then they give you a little bit more clarity. And then you say, well, why is that? And then finally, either after three or six questions, you get to the key point that they were trying to make that they generalized you know, way at the beginning. And so folks, we're back to the, the fact that people try to be delicate right. in how they answer questions. Uh, political is another way of of interpreting that word. And as such, you don't get complete information. Even in the case of coworkers who are one another's lungs, uh, consistently <laughs> trying to rip the other one's heart out. Right. People operate at a high level of defining it. And unless you ask them, so what's the history of that? How did that happen? Right. You know, how well, some people, some people can be curious, right? So you could be having a tough time in a new job and go see a colleague and say, hey, you know, can I talk to you a little bit about X, Y, and Z? And that person might say, well, I can, but what have you been told, right? Because I want to know a little bit more about what you've been told so I can understand the gap between what you believe and what you're experiencing. And they may be very candid to say, well, I don't believe what you've been told is accurate or what you've been told is partly accurate, but not fully. But let me tell you my perception of the experience, because the more you know, and I think what we're also talking about, Jeff, is transparency and candor, right? The more I know about stuff that's accurate, the better I am at doing something about it. If I don't know the truth, then I'm, who knows what I'm trying to solve, right? If I don't know the truth, but if I know the actual experience or truth people have, now I have something I can do something with. Great. And folks, if you've watched me at different times or listened to me at different times, you know, in the interview process, I believe in trying to get an idea of number one, what their expectations are, are going to be of you for the first 30, 60, 90 days. So we're right on board with this. But then there's the one year mark to get an idea of what the deliverables are going to be, how they're going to evaluate you after one year. I've got some sweet language around that. So it's not just simply, hey, so tell me what success is going to look like after a year, because that one they know how to answer and they can con you with that. 
So I have some different language that basically translates to the same thing that gives a more honest appraisal. And as you're starting to hear some of these uh, pieces of information, remember to connect the dots back to what you've been told your objectives are for a year and for 90 days so you can start seeing how this can get smoothed out or may cause interference with you achieving some of your objectives so you can start addressing them early in conversations with your boss. That one makes sense because I'm kind of taking your ideas and some of mine and connecting them together. Oh, it makes perfect sense. I mean, a lot of the work we do, and that when I say we, I mean you and me, Jeff, are helping people on the how part of their job. I'm not an expert in the what side. So if I'm working with a pharmaceutical engineer or an attorney, I can't help them be a better attorney technically or a better pharmaceutical engineer technically. But what we spend time on is how they're leading, how they're influencing, how they're building their self-awareness on how people are experiencing them, whether they want to hear it or not. And the one year mark is a great time to do, for example, a 360 where you can go in and ask people, I've been here a year now. Tell me how you're experiencing me. Do you like how I'm working? Do you like how we're interacting? Or don't you, right? And of course, it's always confidential and anonymous. So people have a tendency to be a little bit more candid. But if you don't know how people are experiencing you, if your self-awareness is not high, you're going to be in trouble. And, we, and for those who might not know what a 360 is, could you define it and how it, it's run by an, an outside resource or an HR organization? Sure. A 360 is a feedback assessment tool where we create a list of raters. So you as the client would create a list of raters. These are people that we collect feedback from. You get the list approved by your boss. Uh, so we know that you just don't pick all your poker buddies. And then we invite them and you actually invite them into the process. Some companies have either a uh, self-created or they've bought a 360 online. Others look to me and say, hey, Ed, what 360 do you use? And can you bring that into the organization? But you invite them as the client. You ask for their feedback. You ask for it to be candid. You want to know how people are experiencing you. And then we kick off the process. And just to be clear, that was R-A-T-E-R-S, not Raiders like in of the Lost Ark. <laughs> Right, R-A-T-E-R-S, you got it. Just making sure. So what other sorts of things should a person do in launching at a new organization in order to stand out, be more likely to succeed? What sort of things do you point people to? Well, uh, ironically, in my first book, Raise Your Visibility and Value, I talk about seven, <coughs> excuse me, visibility accelerators. And those seven visibility accelerators are designed for people who either are not new in an organization but want to raise their visibility or are new to an organization and want to ensure that they are very visible. So a couple of them, for example, include ensuring that you're very visible within your organization and your industry. And what happens, Jeff, is when people join an organization, like the example we talked about earlier, where all their job work effort shuts down and now they just focus on doing the best job possible at the organization, they also disconnect themselves from their industry. So whether you're in the pharmaceutical industry or the legal industry, the manufacturing industry, whatever it might be, it's critical that you look for ways, not many, just a couple, but look for ways to stay visible in that organization. And then the most common way for people are to join affiliation groups and every industry has an affiliation group, although today they're meeting virtually versus uh, in person. But you know, every industry has an affiliation group that you can join in order to raise your visibility. And the beauty of being part of a industry group is that you can bring information back to your organization. So you can bring back best practices. You can hire a consultant that you met at a uh, affiliation group. You can uh, bring back new trends or best practices that, you know, you want your organization to be aware of. So, you know, that's one area that I also see many people shut down that I believe the opposite behavior should exist, which is actually ensuring that even though I'm working and even though I'm employed and even though my company is expecting me to give 60 hours a week, I have to stay visible within my industry because also today we know that someone can get laid off at any point. I'm sure you can remember, you know, 20 years ago, most people got laid off in January because that was the start of the fiscal year, if at all. I mean, there were times where layoffs rarely ever happened. Now they can happen any day of the week for any reason to any number of people. I'm not suggesting any of our listeners might be that way, but I guarantee you if it does happen, 
you'll be very glad that you are very visible within your industry. And I'll go back to the days where it would happen before Thanksgiving to avoid the Christmas <laughs> bonus. Right. <laughs> so early in the week, like the Monday of Thanksgiving week, people were nervous about whether they'd be called in. If they saw people in suits in the conference room, they knew layoffs were coming. And I'm curious, I'm going to back up to something. And it was your reference to during these times with so many groups of meeting virtually. Is there a difference to having these meetings with the different constituencies in an organization done over video, Zoom, WebEx, however it's being done. And do you sense any sort of a difference in how the communication comes out, how authentic it is, stuff along those lines? Yeah, I mean, this is a whole new world order. Ironically, people have been connecting virtually for years. So this isn't like something that just started in March and everybody is trying to figure out how to navigate it. But, you know, the most basic one, Jeff, that people need to be highly aware of is what I call presence. And we talked about leaders and their presence in person, but your presence online is as critical as in person. And I hope you can see today that, you know, I'm sitting in the middle. Uh, I've got uh, a nice centered look. I don't have a fake background of the Bahamas. Um, you know, this is, this is my house, right? So, you know, we want to be transparent because this is where I live and this is where I work from. So, you know, one piece of advice I would give folks is to ensure you know, whether it's a small 20 minute meeting or an hour session or two hour workshop, that you're very, very present, that you have other technology turned off, that you're physically, obviously committed to the meeting, uh, that your camera is set. You know, I have people who uh, look like this during the whole session because their video is here, but their camera is here. And I wanna, you know, jump in, I can't, but say, hey, you've got to set your, you've got to create a different setup because it doesn't look like you're paying attention, right? So I would just say, you know, presence as number one is a huge differentiator for people in uh, virtual communications. And I'm going to pause for a second and say, when you have two monitors, you have to be aware. Just the yeah. same way is if you have a, a single monitor, I use Zoom for everything that I do and you put it on speaker view so that the speaker is front and center. I'm in a small window above, and thus it looks as though I'm making eye contact. Yeah, yeah. And, and that small thing, I remember one time um, I had a labor department case in New York against a former employer who owed me money. Uh, and the, the meeting was done virtually with the, um, the referee in Albany, New York, and us in New York. Uh, and I'm, talk I'm talking to the camera. I knew exactly where to look. My former employer is off in La La Land and not making a connection with people. And that's what you need to do. Yep. Uh, you know, this is all about the first connection. Just it like is. on an interview is the first connection. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I would also tell you, as we talk about this topic, there's a couple of things that you need to do a little bit differently, or some people need to do a little bit differently. I'm not suggesting nobody does what you and I are doing, but... Uh, a large number of people don't, is also make sure that you are in a place where you can turn your camera on. Because, you know, people being able to see you and uh, see you live is a huge differentiator. And one of the key differences between a virtual experience and an in-person experience is virtually, I can see everybody. I mean, I'm looking at everybody's face directly. If you're sitting in a boardroom table, you know, I have to do and, you know, look down to be able to see somebody who's talking. Or if we're at different tables, you know, I've got to turn around and look. But virtually, I can see everyone face on the whole time. And so you don't want to differentiate yourself negatively to other people that are there. So make sure you have a camera. Make sure that you're poised professionally. Make sure I'm not a big fan of the electronic backdrops because I don't think technologically we've gotten there yet. And people still disappear. And you know, they go in and out, et cetera, and that's a distraction. So, you know, these are all things, Jeff, that people could do to be more present at virtual meetings. So funny, when you talk about the backdrops, you know, there are people like Coach who put up the Bahamas scene and they move ever so slightly, part of their arm disappears, they've got the white around their head, you know, because yeah. it just doesn't work perfectly. Exactly. It works very well. 
but it was not perfect. Uh, also, with Zoom and I presume other platforms, there's background noise cancellation that's now available on newer releases of, of Zoom. So okay. just make sure that that's configured because the last thing you want are the sounds of the kids running by uh, in the backdrop. And it really does a very nice job of, of noise cancellation. And this is, uh, you know, for people who are new to an organization, going back to one of our earlier topics, you know, this is a way that you can establish a standard for yourself, especially if you're a leader, uh, you don't just tell everybody on day two, hey, here's how I expect you to look on Zoom, but you observe and watch, right? And then after 90 days, you can come back and say a couple of things we could do a little bit differently to be more effective is to be more present on Zoom. Here's what I've observed over the last, and we keep saying Zoom, there's a number of vendors, Google, Microsoft, right? Uh, Zoom is like Kleenex. I think everyone just says it because that's the word. But, um, you know, here's what I've observed which is a, cre a key differentiator. This isn't something I've observed at other employers. This is something I've observed here. And here's something I think we could do a little bit differently to be more effective. And I'll go the extra step of saying, for you as a leader in an organization, what are you modeling? What are you showing others in your behavior? Because they spot it right away. Especially if what you say is incongruent with what you do. So Absolutely. Uh, and my thing is always about people presenting themselves as being world-class, especially if you're in a leadership role. Mm -hmm. You have to come off as world-class and caring at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, and I want to distinguish the two just because so often when people hear terms like that or professional, you know, it's no personality, hard nose, things along those lines not true at all. Uh, I'll just remind you that if you're in a leadership role, one of your responsibilities is to inspire. It's mm -hmm. not, you're no longer a manager. You have people who manage. Your mm -hmm. job, one of the big parts of your job is to inspire people. And that may involve your selection process, but it also involves who you are and how you present to others throughout your tenure with your organization. And what haven't I asked you about? What haven't we covered yet? that I just haven't been skillful enough to draw out because I know there's more. Well, I mean, we have talked about so much, Jeff. I mean, we've given people dozens of ideas on things that they could do differently to be more effective. And, you know, I hope people listen to your intro because my new book, Drive Your Career, is going to be coming out at the end of September. And in that book, I do include nine ideas that I think apply to people who are either at a role or new to a role that they could do and be more aware of to ensure they're putting on that best professional look, right? I agree with your assessment that this is a time to model good behavior. Don't underestimate people watching you because they are. And this is a great time to demonstrate the best type of leader that you can be. And I'll just be clear, September 2020, and I'll have a link to that book and the first book in the show notes. So you have a chance to check them out. So you've spoken about the book again. Tell folks about your coaching practice, what you do, how they might be able to reach you. Sure. I uh, have been doing leadership coaching for about 12 years, and I do three things. One is one-on-one -on -one leadership coaching with successful leaders. Two is team, lead, uh, team coaching, which is working with teams to help them be more effective and productive. And then three, it's something I call business strategy, which is working with small companies to help them navigate through a new arena due to an acquisition, geography, products and services, whatever is changing is new for them. So if folks would like to reach out, they can go to my website, which is excelius.com, and that's E-X-C-E-L-L-I-U-S.com, or they can email me, ed at excelius.com. Thank you. And folks, we'll be back soon with more. I'm Jeff Alpin, The Big Game Hunter. I know you know that. And if you happen to be interested in my coaching you, at my website, thebiggamehunter.us, there's a place where you can schedule a free discovery call or schedule time for coaching. I frankly would love to help you. And if you have questions for me, I have two ways that you can ask them. First of all, at the site, or, or I'll give you a link now. If you go to the biggamehunter.us forward slash video answers, I'll respond with a three to five minute uh, video for you with an answer to your question. Or if you want to schedule 15 to 20 minutes with me, you can go to the biggamehunter.us forward slash live, and we'll schedule a short conversation 
to answer your questions. Whichever way works for you, I'm happy with. My LinkedIn page is linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash the big game hunter. Send the connection request to me there. Mention you saw the interview. I like knowing I'm helping some folks. And besides, my network is gonna be bigger than yours. It's gonna be able to help you throughout your career. After all, I was member 7653 on LinkedIn. So I'll close by saying, don't be afraid to ask for help. Folks need help more than they know, especially during complicated times like these. I'm Jeff Altman, hope you have a terrific day and most importantly, be great. Take care.